my name is Matthew. I'm a co-founder of a company named Pharos, and we're a small startup. Um, I used to work at Salesforce, and I left that place about a year ago. I worked on Einstein platform together with Vlad. Um, and now I'm building a new, new thing. It's a new gig. So um, this presentation today, I will show some demo of the product. And then I'll show what the under the hood technology is and how do we actually make it happen. Um, what else can I like for the intro part? Um, we do a bunch of Scala stuff and TypeScript. Um, so we're big fans of you know type languages. Um, and really the company is, uh, you know, since it's a platform play, we, we're trying to, to leverage that as much as we can. Because, uh, Type languages have a lot of issues with, in general, with you know even robust software in general. Um, so um, so what what Ferris is? So it's a we build a platform to automate a bunch of cloud operations. So think about um, you know you can think of uh, Zapier for DevOps. So it's kind of just trying to connect two terms in your head. Um, so think of little little scripts that people write to whatever, let's say, spool up or shut down unutilized instances, or you know, figure out what's wrong with their buckets or different permission sets. Uh, that would go and write a bunch of little scripts, or maybe even Terraform scripts nowadays. That would verify and double check uh, your infrastructure. So what we thought is that hey, maybe we can build a good product around it and you know, and give, give it to people, see how they, how they like it. So um, uh, may I just share my screen now? Let's see, yeah, I think I can share my screen. So yeah, you should, share, should see my screen now. So let's maybe start with a, with a problem. So uh, hopefully most of you already know what, uh, you know, what AWS is. And this is AWS console, you know, I, I suppose a lot of you have seen it. And uh, a lot of times what we have, either one team or multiple teams use the same account in the company. So we would have, um, uh, well, just I'll move the, the presentation bar aside. What we'll have is that we'll have multiple regions in our account, or even sometimes multiple accounts. Um, and then sometimes, let's say, as a security professionals or you know, software professionals, we wanna make sure that our infrastructure is secured, or we also have the, the most, um, the best cost that we get on the service that, that we use and so forth. So to do that with, with the console, it's actually a lot of clicking. So let's say you kind of need to be aware of what's running because otherwise you have no idea. So uh, you can maybe go again to console home. What you presented is, is this like list of services and Amazon has about 200, whatever, 50 plus services. So if I go to EC2, for example, if I'm lucky, I would see some running instances on this on this region. Uh, if I'm not lucky, uh, let's say I'm in the Seoul region, I won't see anything, but in order to me to figure out where I have instances running, how they configured all the VPCs, security groups and everything, what answers, I have to click through every single region and figure that out. So for example, now I wanna know where do I have instances, how they're utilized. So I'll have to go to whatever, North Virginia and so forth, click through that. Similarly, up here, I have another instance here. Um, similarly, I would have to go with, with S3. So S3 luckily is like a global service. So here you kind of quickly can see all your buckets that you have. Uh, but then for each bucket, there's so many uh, properties you can tune and set. So for example, I would need to go and see, okay, what do I have? What is this bucket? What's, let's say this one is empty, but then I have to figure out what uses this bucket, what's stored in the bucket, and then if it's even properly configured, what, what if this bucket is you know, publicly accessible? So I have to go and, and figure out, okay, look, uh, that's nice. I have an encryption. I don't have anything else. I have some tags defined. So I have to go and look into those things. I um, need to verify the permissions. Okay, it looks like this one is blocked. Uh, but then there's so many things you need to kind of make sure, right? There's an access control list, the bucket policy, course configuration. Um, there are different access points. Um, so what I'm leading to is that it's very difficult to get a good um, eagle eye view from what's going on in the infra. It's very difficult to know what is what is used, how much do you pay, and then because you have to actually go uh, 
and explore those things in the console. Another option is right is uh, is use the um, let's see if I have this here um, export AWS profile is to use the command line. So I'm going to export my own profile and then I have to do a, a, a AWS S3 LS to get all my buckets, but it's not enough. Um, as I mentioned, you want to figure out what's actually hidden inside the bucket. I would actually either need to write some script to do that for me. So S3 has an API, which I would need to use. Um, so for example, in this case, okay, I have the, let's say I want to do um, what I want to do, encryption. So I have get bucket encryption. So I need to invoke this API for every single bucket that I have, right? Um, and then I need to also know this command, right? So this is like, okay, bucket. And then I get, I get to something, right? I finally see, okay, it looks like it's enabled. There is some KMS master key being used, looks good. Well, what if I tell you it's, you know, they should be, it's a simpler way. And it should be a simpler way because it's very difficult. Um, I don't know how much, how many of you actually operated large AWS accounts um, when you have, you know, thousands of instances, you know, multiple thousands of buckets. Um, and I'm not also talking about IAM. So this is nothing I didn't mention, right? We have IAM, which is pretty complicated, uh, the way it's defined. You have, um, you have the, you have a bunch of users, you have groups, you have roles, uh, users can assume roles. You can have different policies attached either directly to users or to groups or to some roles. Um, so it becomes very difficult to figure out for any given user what this user can do, for example, on your infra. So uh, any questions so far? Let's do like a very quick sync. If anyone has questions, maybe just shut it out. Okay, I assume no questions so far, perfect. So let's kind of assume this is our problem statement. So what we did that at first we kind of said, okay, let's unite all those APIs into one, one API that we can easily query. And kind of so, somewhat natural was to pick the GraphQL. So who is not familiar with GraphQL, uh, it's a spec uh, that was introduced by Facebook. And um, um, what they define is that, uh, let's see if I, if I have the documentation here, is that what, what it defines like, as a bunch of types and relations between types. And then it also defines how you can query it and paginate through the results. There's a bunch of other things such as, you know, mutations on the top of queries. So I'm not gonna touch that part. Uh, and then we decide, okay, let's let's pick up on the GraphQL and, uh, um, and try to, to see if we can put the GraphQL on top of Amazon, on top of uh, all those different services, GitHub, PagerDuty, um, and many others um, to, um, to put so, um, a, a better user experience for people. So this is our website and then um, we have this kind of explorer part here. So what this opens is opens a GraphQL ex uh, graphical explorer for my infrastructure. So let's even de de delete the query and let's even assume you don't know how to write GraphQL, that's also fine. So you can click through the thing. So what I'm interested in right now is figure out how many of my buckets have encryptions and encryption enabled. So I can go here and see S3 bucket, uh, click on the data. I want a name of the bucket. Uh, so I can easily get all my buckets that I have running. Uh, then I can say, uh, okay, where's my encryption? Okay, encryption. I wanna see the if it has any algorithms enabled. And I can very quickly see that I have two buckets and one of them is not encrypted. Okay, so I can, Maybe go ahead and write some script now to execute this query and then get the results, process them, and maybe alert me if I have this something like this happening. Yeah. Now I can immediately query a bunch of other things that you've seen in the UI that I have to go and click through like different statuses and versioning, and I can see um, and I can see different interesting things like okay, what's what's the status of this? Suspended, I have suspended version on two buckets and one of them is not even enabled. Um, so it, it becomes very easy to, um, to kind of just navigate your infra. Okay, let's, let's look on the instances now. 
I can look on the EC2 instance. I want to look on all the data. Maybe I want to look on the image ID. Um, what else want to do? Um, instance ID. Let's see if, how many instances I have running. Let's remove the buckets also because they kind of like interfere with the results. Okay, so I immediately see that I have I have all my like across all my accounts I have um, only three instances running. Why am I seeing across all accounts? Because what we did is that we connect all your Amazon accounts across all the regions, collect that data, and you can also see which region and which uh, which account the data is coming from. So it becomes very easy to look at your data and like see how is it being used. Now, here's another question, more complicated one. What if I want to know for each instance um, how much I pay for it? Okay, so I would need to go to the instance and I would need to see the probably the instance type, right? I would probably need to know the, the region that it's running because it's kind of different per region. I would need to know what's the what's the operating system I'm using because different operating systems would have different pricing. Um, what else do I want to know um, to compute the price? Maybe additional resources are attached, maybe the, the EBS volumes and so forth. So one simplif simplistic way to do it is, you know, go to EC2 instances info. This is like a, some friendly website somebody built and kind of start, you know, looking for your T2 micro and find the instance figure out, okay, it's on demand cost or reserved. I actually don't know what am I using even, is it on demand or reserved or, and so forth. And it's also not, not complete. Um, so whoever works with Amazon knows that they have actually um, a command line, command line tool. So you can, you can actually query the pricing. The command line tool is somewhat complicated to use. So you would go and do so here I'm just one query is I want a 2T micro instance in the US East region without even specifying operating system. So it will give me like a bunch of information that I would have to go and parse it. So this gives me, I think, paginated response with some convoluted escape JSON. Um, um, so it becomes pretty complex to compute. So what we did with, did with Ferris is that we actually prefetched all this data and then we pre-joined it with, uh, with all the resources that we have. So you need to have the price information. So I can go click on, I'm, I'm right now it's still in the instance. So I'm clicking on the price. I immediately know that it's on demand instance. I can also see, okay, price per unit. This is another query that we did. And then you immediately get how much you have, you are paying for this instance per hour so for example, I can see I have, let's let's get the image where I have the image. I do have the image ID. So here for this image ID, I'm paying 11 cents uh, per hour, but this one is 71, or sorry, it's not 71, it's uh, seven cents. And then that was like a little bit more than one cent. Um, I can also see different things like licenses. So th this becomes very, very easy. Um, to get to know your infra pretty quickly. Um, in the scope of automation, right? I actually wanna put this query into some action. So what I wanna really do is that maybe I wanna do some kind of pre-processing and then do schedule it on a periodic basis and so forth. Uh, so what we've been working on is that we kind of also trying to improve on, the, on this experience. Let's take this query into this new graphical and then we we started introducing different additional components like a JSON path and so forth. So where I can uh, where I can uh, query uh, pretty quickly different different things and like fil filter out um, filter out the data as I go. Okay, I think this this is the data, and then I need the star here. So whoever's familiar with the JSON path might know that that's kind of pretty standard, the, the syntax. Um, so this also wasn't enough for us. With that, we said, okay, queries are great. Now we have the we also have the data model. We have the queries that we can execute in the GraphQL. 
Uh, and the data model, we kind of we, we kind of keep updating it. So we have, for example, our own data model where, where you know we expose different things. Uh, we took the whole GitHub API where we worked it, and we took the whole pager duty and so forth. So we're kind of adding a little bit by little uh, every week uh, one new API. Um, so let's switch uh, gears a little bit to the command line. So let's do. Um, so we have, the, we have the command line in which you can take this to the next level. Not only you can uh, execute queries, but you can also build interactive apps and pretty much extend our existing API with something that you want to be uh, you want to be using internally for your teams and so forth. So uh, Paris app. Let's see if I have any apps defined. I actually do have my app defined. Let's maybe define another one. So let's do um, Pharos app init. Um, what's app ID for app? My, okay, let's do EC2. Uh, EC2 instances. Uh, nothing. So I will do Python. Currently only the Python is supported. Then yeah, let's open an editor here. So uh, the apps you see, this is the apps we developed uh, and they're all available on the GitHub. Um, this is the app I currently added. So kind of generates a little template in which I can, oh, this is the, the other app. Uh, one what I created was this one, yeah. So what I can do, I can take this, the same query that I just had with the pricing and I can uh, pretty much Paste it here. Uh, what else can I do here? Uh, let's copy that from my other app. So this is, you know, pretty standard Python. Something like this. Um, what else I can do? Uh, set um, field. You see two instances. I have to build it. This will download the dependencies, and then I can invoke it. All right. So here I get exactly the same results. Let's pass it through jQuery to kind of highlight it. Um, and I can immediately use it for, for other things inside my scripts. So I can quickly get a lot of information without messing up with Amazon CLI, or also imagine different CLIs, because we have different data sources, uh, quickly into your scripts. What's cool about this is that once you have the app, you can also deploy it, and then it becomes invocable from the API. So you pretty much get your own, you know, HTTP API for getting your specialized view on any infrastructure that you have. Uh, let me deploy that, and then let's say now I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm with my uh, team on Slack. I think I actually already invoked it. And what I can do, I can do, yeah, I can, um, I can list all my apps. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I can, I see my, just the app I just created. And I can do Pharos app invoke, and I can pass in the app that I have. So boom, I just got exactly the same results. Um, you don't have to develop apps, obviously. You can also do uh, Pharos app list and then see what we have to offer. Okay, so you can look on all the apps that we've built and we kind of keep building. And we also have con community contribution um, apps that we um, that we already uh, accepted. So for example, I can look on the inactive users. Pharos app uh, inactive users. Oh, yeah, because it's a global app. We're still working on making this like, experience a bit better. It's not, not super obvious. Okay, so I need to pass in a param. Pharos app invoke uh, dash p max days maybe 30. Okay, here we go. I have, I have three inactive users on my account. Um, so uh, this is handy and everything. Now think, let's take it to the next level. 
and think, let's say I want to build a compliance template. I want to make sure I run all the apps across all my accounts, across all my regions to make sure that my infrastructure is secure. So what I need to do here is that, um, let's see if I have, if I have this, um, Help. So I have uh, I have this. We started building this like Uber apps that contain that execute multiple apps simultaneously. Imagine like they just do for loop pretty much, um, and then they give you the report back. And if they find anything, you also see the issues, and we also give you the the command that you want to execute on your infra to actually see the full details. So I can immediately say, oh look, I have someone encrypted volumes on my account, that's not good. Uh, let's run this. And I actually do have three unencrypted uh, volumes, so I need to maybe do something with that, delete them, or maybe actually enable encryption. Okay, so this concludes my demo. Um, now let's see if anyone has questions, and otherwise I'll go to the second part to show how this works. Okay, well, I assume there are no questions. Um, okay, so to make this whole thing work, we had to, as I mentioned, uh, expose GraphQL, a new data format for the whole set of, for the whole bunch of APIs that we collect the data from. So in order to make that happen, uh, we did we did multiple things. One of them, we need we needed a, a quick way of taking an underlying data source and making sure we can import data in a generalized, simplified way and export it into the GraphQL format. Once it's in GraphQL format, it becomes quite trivial to serve it. There's a bunch of tools. Um, you can look it up, like um, you know Apollo Foundation. Uh, well, I'm not going to go, but um, uh, that allow you to stitch schemas together uh, and everything. So let's take AWS as an example. So I did a, you know, quite an investigation how Amazon, uh, how Amazon developers actually do uh, their clients. So if you go and look on the, let's say, official SDK for Java, you will see a bunch of clients. And they, um, they kind of very, very um, similar to each other. And then what you would notice is that they have things called Think of called Gen Maven plugin. So this plugin that generates all those client code, including the the, the clients, the invokers, the, the the response and request marshallers, authentication. There's a bunch of bunch of things uh, that they did. Um, and the the way they do it again, if you kind of start digging into how the code gen works, I'm not going to do that. That's pretty uh, nasty Java business. Um, what you would find is that they, they actually have a source of truth called, you know, uh, Java SDK models, and then they have this like specialized format that they define. So let's look on EC2, uh, EC2 instance model. There's also an intermediate file. Let's open this one. So this is a very large file um, that defines the whole EC2 API. From which you can, you know, can figure out the version, blah, blah blah, the the namespace, and then you can start looking onto interesting things like this. Um, describe, uh, describe in instances, uh, describe instances. I can find it right now. Oh, here, describe instances. It's a post call. There's a special request you need to make. And it's a large structure. This is, by the way, where you get all the documentation from. So if you go, for example, to Amazon, uh, you know, API documentation, you would also see all their pages generated from this format. So we got that. Oh, that's a good. That, that that's a pretty much a source of truth from which we can take it to the next level, to the to the um, some kind of generation of the GraphQL schema. So what we wrote is that um, we wrote this special uh, model parser. So this is a little parser that we did that knows to parse all AWS files. Again, it's kind of pretty classical, very small, you know, pretty much the JSON-based parsing. Um, here, 
So we have to go and define all the abstract data types for, for the types of, for example, the model um, with the metadata and uh, you know, operations uh, and express all the, file, uh, all, all the fine types that they have defined in the JSON. Once we uh, parse that, we were able to, um, to then process it and do some additional pro um, schema generation on top. Um, so I can I can show how that works. I have this SBT somewhere. So here I have my SBT working here, and I have this um, schema generator that we did. So this right now will generate the whole. I think the whole AWS schema if I run this. It will take those model files and you know put some warnings that or debugging that about things that are being replaced and so forth, and that will generate me this this file which isn't here. And then you can see the whole uh, GraphQL schema that we just spoke. So in the sense that this is almost everything we need, except this is just the proxy types. So if you start digging into GraphQL again, I don't know how much knowledge you have. What you need to do is that once you expose the schema, there is also, uh, um, in the back end, you need to actually define the resolvers. So this is the actual code that when you do describe EC2 instances, so you have EC2, EC2 uh, describe, or whatever, whatever the call you do um, on, the, on the query level, so this is the query level, you need to actually map it to the resolver. So that resolver have to actually go and, and list the, the security groups. Uh, so for that, we have to build um, an AWS client that would be generic enough to execute those. So we chose uh, um, HTTP, um, HTTP uh, 4S library. That uh, was a pretty good choice in general. We um, were very happy with that. Built you know, quite, um, quite a good client there that allows us to, to invoke, invoke different methods and um, the interface for it looks pretty much like this. So you kind of just do a query you pass in your credentials, your region, endpoint prefix, operation, bunch of params, and then you get a bunch of JSON uh, results back. Okay, so this is again, next step. So we, we, queried, we queried the results, we expose them for GraphQL. Now, there are actual relations that you need to define between the types. So if I go back to the schema, and let's say I go to um, the price, here, on-demand, AWS on-demand price. So if I go into here again, AWS price. So I have the price property defined on the EC2 instance that was generated. So something needs to actually go and query because it's not part of the regular AWS API. So to do that, we build an, an additional component which we call you know, Cloud Connector. Uh, what that, that utility does is that it queries a bunch of APIs in the sequence, joins the results together and stores them in a format that GraphQL uh, consumes, or whatever kind of knows to expose pretty quickly. Um, so let's see. Um, so I, I generated this, um, um, this whitelist. So this again, like a little sample, we have a much larger whitelist in which we define the, um, the graph of API calls of different entities and how they depend on each other. So for example, when I query, let's say here, ECS, AWS ECS, I start by listing the clusters. And then for each, uh, for each cluster, hard, I need to go and uh, do the describe cluster call. And for each, for each of the cluster information, I need to go and now fetch the services and task definitions and so forth. Um, so the cool part is that you kind of see like a special syntax here. So another tool that we used was um, Ampler. I don't know how much of you are familiar with this. Um, Ampler. Ampler. Ampler 4. So I can, uh, I can highly recommend on that. It's a very really excellent tool to build in your um, I'm building your little uh, languages, not even little, you can parse, you know, large code bases with it. Uh, despite the fact that it's been in, um, 
in Java, there is a bunch of tooling you can have. So I can actually demonstrate you something. So uh, the whitelist that you see here, we have a much larger one, um, is that you, um, we parse it with this dial, so this uh, grammar. So the grammar is very compact. And then um, if whoever is using IntelliJ, I find it very you know, satisfying that IntelliJ has so, so many plugins. And one of those plugins are actually allows me to run grammars. Uh, so this is actually a relation one. Let's do um, entity source. So what I, I'm running against now, I'm, I'm parsing this whitelist that I showed you. It shows me the, the whole parse tree, um, the syntax tree. And on the right, I can have this visual debugger. So if I, if I, make, if I make a mistake somewhere, so let's say entity source is sample. Let's say I make a, I make a mistake here with putting a bunch of dots here. Nope, don't wanna save this. I immediately get this like nice violation and it's like, oh, it's an unexpected symbol. So it's, it's just extremely nice tool for doing development uh, with this grammar. Um, SBD has a nice plugin also. So once you have defined grammar, uh, SBD would go ahead and um, there's an Ampler plugin for it that generates, um, that generates uh, all the classes that you need. So this is a plugin we're using. Um, various all the all the classes you need uh, to actually access the results of the grammar and par parse it into your code. Very easy to use. Also, kind of recommend it. Um, so once we have the grammar, this gives us basically the view now of uh, all the all the sources that we want to be querying. So once we store them, now we need to connect between the data. So this is where we define the next set of grammar which was the you know, entity relations in which we define what are the connections we're making between different entities. So here's, I'm just trying to get a small snippet. Let's say I wanna connect the instance to a volume uh, and I connect it through the attachment. So I'm doing this basically connect one to many, the relations one to many between the EC2 instance, I can prefix it because you know we can have uh, stuff connected between GitHub and EC2 or whatever, um, Travis and PagerDuty. Mm. Um, and then I'm also saying what kind of um, function I want to apply to um, to compute this relation between entities. Okay. Um, okay. And then for GraphQL, whatever the, we generated, we used a couple other libraries. So we're currently using Sangria. I don't know what's the deal with Sangria. I think it's it's kind of getting off. Uh, off-white a little bit, maybe not that well maintained as before, uh, but so far it's working just fine. You can define pretty complex, you know, schemas. So we use you know, schema definition language that they have. There's a new library that kind of started uh, taking off was uh, called Caliban. So I'm heavily considering using that next. Um, that one has a very nice integration with a bunch of libraries. So uh, we're currently on cats, but you know, it works with Monix and uh, obviously Zio now, uh, the rising star uh, of the functional programming landscape, I would call it like this. Uh, and then if you're kind of not happy with using Zio, you can again interrupt with cats and so forth. So this is a more proper, I guess, probably nicer way of working with GraphQL schema because it's, um, um, Conceptually, it just built nicer. The whole the whole library, if you're gonna go and start looking in the code, I think it, they have a better grasp on how to define um, define syntax better. Uh, what else do I want to tell you about? Um, hey Matthew. Uh, yeah. There are some questions on the chat. I think. Oh, perfect. Hey, let's look on the questions. Thanks, Vitaly. Uh, oops. I actually don't see the chat anywhere. Okay, chat, question in the chat. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking on them. Uh, this is amazing, how can I use it? Okay, so there is nothing you need to do pretty much to use it. You just go to ferris.ai and then you click try it for free and that's it. There's a documentation for you to, to, to get going. It's very easy, there is no gun. It's, it's currently free of use. We are working on having the, the paid tier. 
so far, you know, knock yourself out and, you know, give us feedback if you like it. So it pretty much starts with installing the CLI and then you have the, the follow-up setups for services. Do the results typically cache the results for future queries? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we do uh, we do have any cache. Uh, that's how you get uh, that's how you get a pretty snappy responses. So kind of if you execute it, you see this like spinner, but then all the follow-up queries are pretty quick. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, we strongly consider adopting GraphQL and have been torn between Sangre and Caliban given Sangre recent uncertainty. I believe Twitter is a Sangre user. That's correct. Um, Caliban is very well maintained, highly recommended. Yeah, so Solar probably is one of the maintainers of the Caliban. So, yes, by the way, Kudos on the library. Uh, it's a good one. So, yeah. If you're starting a new project now, probably start with Caliban. Don't use Sangre. Uh, okay, any more questions? I guess I can maybe stop sharing or... Oh, I actually wanted to mention one more library um, that we use. So we also expose uh, an API, which is, uh, you know, open API. And it's, there is a very nice library by uh, Software Mill called Tapir. And what they do, they allow you to um, expose open API specs for your uh, HTTP 4S or whatever Finatra. I'm not a big fan of their, you know, syntax and everything, but it does the, the job done very nicely. So if you, if you want to do open API, this is the way to go. It's a pretty nice library that integrates with Cersei and other things. Nice, Caliban has a Tapper plugin, okay. Okay, any more questions? And I guess this is this is your time, folks. So maybe you want to discuss something. Okay, well I guess uh, I guess it is no and Vlad, what are our next Yes, step? I'm well, so I was just personally really impressed by like the code you showed and by this beautiful functionality. And so like anybody wants to, so if you are done, anybody wants to talk about anything? No, okay. Everybody's happy and impressed. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. So if anyone has questions, by the way, we have a community, so just come over. Um, talk to us and we really we can also share more details on how it's built and things, things we kind of struggle with and the difficulties i also noticed in slack you have a bot that does command line right yeah it's very similar it's to command cool. so we were trying to kind of make it also look very similar to um to what you what your experiences with the command line so you don't have yeah. to learn two tools Nice. Yeah, so I'm here and uh, use the Caliban library. Matthew, you're not sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, uh, well, I shared the, yeah, let me share the screen. So yeah, Caliban is here. Um, I think it ha they have this with our weird URL there. I, I placed it on the chat. Yeah, this chat button constantly escapes from you. Like, I'm not a big fan of the Zoom UI, to be honest, out here, chat. Um, uh, can you connect between different services, AWS and GitHub? Uh, yes, um, we're, we're planning to do that. Currently, we don't have that much connections between them, but yes, this is this is definitely common. Um, so the idea is actually to get interconnected data sources. Okay, I guess uh, thanks everyone. Um, this is the, the end of my presentation. Yes, come over and chat to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very cool. Thanks a lot.